Right, welcome. This is um, part two of conceptual art. Today we are looking at um, a little bit more in depth. The last time I introduced you to quite complicated philosophical um, jargon that gets thrown around when we're discussing conceptual art, and specifically we spoke about semiotics and about deconstructivism. Uh, today we'll be looking at what inspired conceptual art, uh, remembering that it started in the mid 60s. Um, so it was kind of working alongside other movements that you should have already done if you're a matric student right now. I want to start by posing the following question. Firstly, do you know what the maker of words is called? Do you know what that term is? Because um, we know what the maker of art is called. That is called an artist, right? And they create art. So does a wordist create words? give it a second or two but no a neologist creates words or neologisms right I don't know if I'm saying that correctly but you aren't going to question a word based on how it was made because a word is made up of letters a letters creates a word a word has a dictionary definition which has meanings yet we question the definition of art over and over and over again. So does that change what an artist is? Does it, if a word weren't a word <laughs> because it wasn't made up of letters somehow, would that then make the word maker something other than a neologist? So if an artwork is not an artwork because it's not made up of art materials, does that make the artist any less of an artist? Right, with that very complicated um, start <laughs> I'd like to say that conceptual art questions all definitions okay? it questions specifically definitions of art and where those definitions came from why we believe them why society created those definitions and what is it within us that feels that we need to continue those definitions um, or question them which is essentially what conceptual artists were doing they were trying to dematerialize art. Now that sounds a bit silly because you need art materials to create art, but what it means is that they were trying to create art using materials that weren't necessarily associated with art production. Um, in fact, they often saw um, traditional media as kind of imposing on what they were trying to do. So they had a, a hostile relationship with things like paint and sculpture and traditional materials that came from the Western canon of art. So as you have been taught up till now, unfortunately, um, the Western canon follows through from the Renaissance being the major enlightened movement where the high and mighty artist created something as realistically as possible or as idealized as possible. And, and we followed through in that narrative for quite some time. Whereas conceptual art is one of the first art movements to make a movement out of that questioning. So um, just to repeat, they dematerialized art by broadening the approach to art materials. Okay, so conceptual artists were hostile towards very traditional mediums and therefore they started looking to things such as text, photography, found objects, even the physical space of an artwork, as well as performance, art, fluxes, all of these became art materials or mediums with which to communicate the artwork. Um, we'll look a little bit later into the inspiration for this and um, I'm sure most of you are thinking already because you're so genius you're thinking da da because of found materials and the ready-made and you're right so we're gonna get into that in a moment first I want to go through some other things that conceptual art is known for so conceptual artists like to emphasize the process a lot of the time and um, because a final product in terms of art further exemplifies the fact that a lot of time and skill has gone into creating this final product. So um, conceptual artists focus on a process again. They're moving away from the view that art is some gateway to another transcendental world. So if you think of the Romantics and of Neoclassicism and Baroque and all of that, it was about creating this artwork that kind of emulated reality in a sense but at the same time when you looked at it you had what we know to be the sublime experience Edmund Burke's notion of sublime where you look at something and it kind of just makes your jaw drop you feel like 
oh wow this is so beautiful I just you're taken so aback by it so um, oh the cat's coming out of the cupboard I told you it was gonna happen <laughs> there she goes <laughs> all right so um, a sublime experience would be equated to standing on the end of a mountain cliff and just feeling like you could just jump that's how amazing this experience is so we're used to artworks that give us this otherworldly experience but we're not used to art that invades our space and almost makes us rethink the experience we're living right now and the ex how we're interacting with this artwork instead of looking at something and saying actually that's a farce it's made out of paint to make me believe that it's something else but this is a reality you know I'm actually stepping in the paint for example or I'm part of the artwork because I'm just experiencing it and that makes me a valuable asset in this um, art process right so that's the the third thing so the first thing was dematerialization of art second thing I introduced was the different types of um, art uh, avenues that they chose to use um, emphasis on process rather than the final product and a move away from the view that art is some gateway to another transcendental world rather they brought attention to the immediate environment by questioning how we perceive what we see and why do we see things certain ways so going back to what we learned from the previous episode of semiotics and how um, some signs are learned uh, conceptual artists try to question why we learned them that way and why we still believe those learned signs to be true okay so now we're gonna go to the inspiration firstly you were right Dadaism okay if we look at Deschamps artworks we all know um, that he painted a urinal with the title RR Mutt or the name we know a couple of his artworks but for this specific example I want to look at 50 cc's of Paris A. okay it obviously had a French title in its day and it was created in 1919 literally a glass ampule that would have had some serum in it that um, Duchamp emptied out and replaced with Paris A. okay now nothing can be more ready-made than A. air is there you don't do anything to it to make it an artwork it is already an artwork just by existing and calling it an artwork and this brings me back to my the term for person who creates words the neologist right um, so by Duchamp calling this ampule an artwork it became an artwork like a neologist coins a new word and calls it a new word and it is therefore a new word right so Duchamp inspired uh, the conceptual artists by simply questioning what constituted art did it have to be a painting did it have to be a sculpture oh no it could be anything it could be a ready-made right the next inspiration came from minimalism now often minimalism is perceived as a modern art movement but it is very postmodern in very many ways and this is where it links with conceptual art um, if we look at Donald Judd's six reflective cubes which he left untitled um, these were actually created in the early 70s but the concept of minimalism here becomes really strong influence on conceptual art because if you look at these works they are highly reflective so if you're not in the space of the art gallery they're going to reflect the art gallery right so at some point they reflect the art gallery so well that they might not even exist okay so imagine there was a mirror that is just reflecting a floor and a wall in front of it but you don't see what's behind it it's just gonna look like there's a floor and a wall to you you're not actually gonna know that there's a mirror perhaps and so in this specific artwork we've got six highly reflected blocks that are doing just that they are taking away the fact that there might even be an artwork there they're so highly reflected that they're emphasizing the gallery space and that's all that there is okay the thing that's really interesting about this artwork that inspired conceptual artists is that the minute you walk into the space you're interrupting the artwork you become part of the artwork okay by interrupting this reflection you're proving that the artwork actually exists because now your reflection is part of the artwork so even your legs or your feet or whatever is reflecting in this block is bringing attention to the fact that there is a block there that there is an artwork there that you might not have seen had you not walked into that space okay so conceptual artists 
moving closer towards um, art that you or interactive art um, are now being inspired by minimalist artists because of that um, again minimalism used very little of the medium that we know to be trying to emulate that transcendental um, window to another universe all right Surrealism also inspired uh, conceptual artists very much in the same way and um, they focused on process a lot so we know from the automatists that relied on um, the subconscious and automatic kind of movements if I just throw the string here however it lands that's the artwork and whatever you read from it man that's your psyche and that's that's all why we're all messed up from the world wars and etc okay so surrealism the fact that they did this automatic kind of process art also inspired conceptual artists and um, if we look at Andre Masson's automatic drawings and um, this particular one from 1924 what it does is not only is it a just a bleh from the artist but what you as a, a viewer read into that artwork oh the eggs are ready what you read into that artwork becomes the artwork as well or the interpretation thereof so you become part of the artwork by becoming part of what it's trying to say and um, so for the first time you're seeing artists put something up and saying I don't know what it means whatever you think it means that's what it means okay so conceptual artists really like that process um, then we get to abstract expressionism and we've got Jackson Pollock with his famous drip paintings Jack the Dripper um, his work although again could be uh, seen as modernist in terms of the postmodern reading we're looking at the process so we're looking more at the photographs of him creating his work because yes he's using paint a very traditional medium but how is he using it he's using sticks and twigs and uh, his cigarette stompies land in there and bottle caps and all sorts and it's about body it's about performance about movement about getting his emotions out of him which is the modernist perspective but the way he's doing it is very postmodern and that's what conceptual art uh, was really inspired by was this performance the process how is this artwork created and how can we document that and how does that documentation become another artwork all in its own all right then we look at pop art in pop art we obviously all know the Warhols, um, Warhol and um, your Lichtensteins and all the artists that look at uh, you know popular culture. We um, as conceptual artists uh, look at the, the idea of consumerism and how pop artists were focused on the commodification of art. Okay? And so conceptual artists are really inspired by this. If we look at Klaus Oldenburg's floor burger, it's a giant burger on the floor, but it's in a gallery, which makes it art. Um, this artwork is specifically speaking about the commodification of art as if it's a takeaway, the commodification of food, for example. You know, you can just go through a drive through get a burger, just like any other person. Um, it's also made from... Uh, recycled billboards so that's an interesting addition to it the medium adding to the meaning however what I'm trying to say here is that the pop art preoccupation with the commodification of art really inspired uh, contemporary conceptual artists um, if you look at the art market of the 60s and 70s okay so now the art world had moved many years before that from Paris and Europe and all those art centers to America because America promised money for artists okay because America had money after war and therefore said come all ye artists come make America great again and we will pay you which was great because that's hardly ever happened in the history of art however what started happening was that the art market and art collectors and museum trustees and all of that gained the monopoly over artists okay so if you wanted to make it big you had to kind of get your way into these very niche circles um, and you know kind of sell your soul 
and it still happens today but anyway artists were upset about this they were like we're the ones creating the work how come you get to tell us what is successful what isn't i need the money from you so yeah i'm gonna let whatever you say be successful or successful and therefore hopefully i'll become successful um but it's almost like when you're confined by too many rules you want to break them and that's what conceptual artists did they were felt like they were being put into this box again and we often speak of the the modern art gallery as being the white cube so the cube was becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and they were like <gasps> let's redefine art and so conceptual artists were living in a time that was rife with so many political and uh historical and contextual things that were happening we've got vietnam war we've got the civil rights protest we've got the assassination of kennedy and martin luther king jr we've got the cuban missile crisis we've got cold war we've got the moon landing we've got uh woodstock we've got feminist movements we've got gay liberation movements we've got all of this happening look most of this is happening in the states but remember like i said um the art capital had moved to the states and um, so mid 60s early 70s they were still kind of had the monopoly um but conceptual art now questions anything and everything that links to a concept like we said in the previous episode idea is more important than aesthetic so conceptual art takes a concept pulls it apart deconstructs it questions how it was constructed in the first place through semiotics and poses it to the viewer, allows the viewer to actually say, hmm, how would I interpret this? And can I be an informant in the way I interpret it? And does it make me any less of a viewer if I don't understand or if I question it? Um, does it make it any less of an artwork? If it doesn't look like an artwork, it can't be framed, it can't be mounted and um, made out of bronze. And so yes, conceptual art is very confusing. But so were the times, as are today's times. Um, they were inspired by very many movements that you've already covered. But m most importantly for this episode, we now have the aesthetic could be created from anything. Okay, so dematerialization of art. And for what means to take away the commodification of art and to question constructs that art has been built on. All right. The next episode, will I'll start introducing artists um, for your essay writing. So the artists that I've looked at in episode one and two have been predominantly to just get the context out there and to get you understanding what conceptual art is about. From the next episode, we'll be looking at in-depth discussion of artists and their work and linking it to conceptual art philosophies. So please tune in for episode three next.